All right, here we go. All right, so I'm super excited for this webinar. Um, as always, ask any questions that you might have. Uh, we're gonna be talking again about mood and neurotransmitters and how they affect um, our symptoms, our brain, our mood, all of those good things. So here are our main points. First of all, what the heck are neurotransmitters? Um, we'll go over some some of the main neurotransmitters, there's more than what we'll go over, and the symptoms that are associated when they're imbalanced, how the gut affects neurotransmitters and brain health. Um, this is a repetitive topic in terms of gut health, but I'll make it specific for what we're talking about today. Some other causes of mood changes. Uh, we'll touch on anxiety and depression. That's the most common mood. Um, those are the most common mood disorders or symptoms. Um, does my diet affect my mood? And how can I change my diet to change my mood? And then lastly, about the natural therapies that we can use to improve the symptoms and heal. So let's jump in to the content. All right, so why do I care about mood and mental health? Um, incidences of brain and mood disorders are on the rise. Um, not only that, um, or rather the, the cause of that is just higher toxins um, in our environment, higher demand from the society and social platforms. Um, there's just a lot more that our bodies and our brain have to um, deal with. And so with that comes mood disorders. Um, and I'm going to be reading off some notes just because I have a lot that I want to share. So just to let you guys know, if I'm looking down, I'm reading some facts, um, stats, and other things I want to share that aren't on the PowerPoint. So a um, couple, couple stats here. Um, one in eight senior citizens develop Alzheimer's. One in eight children are diagnosed with brain development disorder, including autism, ADD, and ADHD. So that just shows, you know, how high the incidence of brain and, and mood disorders are. Um, the global prevalence of dementia is estimated to be as high as 24 million and is predicted to double in the next 20 years. Now, part of that is, yes, people are living longer, um, but how can we address the brain and heal the brain before it becomes, um, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera? Anxiety disorders um, such as OCD, learning disabilities, PTSD, ADHD, and depression are also much more prevalent today. I see it all the time, in particular um, with this current generation um, in you know 20 and below, high, high, high anxiety. Again, demands from society, toxins, um, just unable to manage all of that as one single individual. Um, we're not, you know, our bodies are made to be very pliable, malleable, um, adaptive, but um, with that come symptoms of that adaptation. And right now it's showing to be anxiety. Um, a high stress sedentary lifestyle rounds out the perfect recipe for brain degeneration. Um, besides the dietary and lifestyle triggers that create poor brain function, um, previous head injury, subtle brain autoimmunity or inflammation, poor circulation and various other factors can cause the brain to fail and degenerate quickly, leading to an inefficiency at running your own life. So that kind of goes back to, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, even anxiety and depression. So, so those are some of the lifestyle triggers that um, are associated. Antidepressants additionally are the most prescribed drug in the US. Um, whether they're needed or not, they're very, very easily and quickly prescribed. Um, so it's really important to, with that, take responsibility and knowledge and educate yourself on what we can do before we run to antidepressants because there is a time and a place for antidepressants and I, I totally am on board with that. Um, I just find that oftentimes they're not addressing the cause. And so if we can do that, we're going to feel a lot better going forward. Um, some symptoms of poor brain health in general, um, fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, anxiety, depression, paranoia. Those are just some basic, basic, basics. Um, so I care a lot about mood and mental health. I'm fascinated by it. And I love that there's such a wide range um, of things that we can do to address it without going to prescription drugs. So Let's begin what, with what are neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are the chemical messengers that, that basically tell your body to do something. 
Okay, they're, they're messengers. Um, neurons are brain, um, brain cells basically. And so these neurotransmitters transmit information through the neurons. Um, this is showing basically what a neuron looks like um, and how it works. It's, it's too in depth for what we need today, but you can see number two here, uh, right here, the neurotransmitters cross um, the synaptic cleft to the receiving neuron. So um, just demonstrating that they are messengers. A lot can go awry in this cl synaptic cleft you can see right here. Okay, this is where a lot of problems arise um, in an unhealthy system. There can be in there can be insufficient neurotransmitters, so not enough of them. There can be a problem with the presynaptic right here, presynaptic receptor or the postsynaptic receptor, um, or the neurotransmitter doesn't break down, um, or, the, or the gut re, uh, reabsorbs. Sorry, I'm like trying to read my stuff here because I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to add too much to the slide, so I'm reading it. Um, basically, that um, it's an incomplete reaction because um, what's happening at this synaptic cleft can be disrupted. Um, so not enough of the neurotransmitter is being transmitted basically. And then that, that causes further issues down the line because if this is the beginning of a chemical messaging, messen chemical messaging um, pathway and it starts up here, well, all of these are going to, the rest of this um, pathway here is going to be affected as well. So again, a little bit complex, but basically saying there's a lot that can go wrong and this is what we have to address. Um, additionally, and this is very um, interesting and important for a lot of people. Um, this is what I've been finding with a lot of my patients lately is that neurons um, are, are, they're too quickly firing. So what I like to explain, let's say somebody has anxiety, okay? Um, there, there's a stimulus that causes the anxiety, right? Oftentimes people with anxiety have a very, they, they don't need a large stimulus to create the response, okay? Um, other people who maybe have experienced anxiety but don't have anxiety disorder, they need a larger stimulus. So think of, you know, like a little firecracker, one of those little poppers um, as a stimulus. Okay, that can be sim as simple as a, enough of a stimulus to cause an anxiety attack for somebody versus maybe an entire firework right, causing, being the stimulus to cause anxiety for another person. So when our, our, um, our neurons are too close to firing, right, they don't need a large stimulus to fire, okay, versus having a large stimulus and then firing, right? So this is caused by a lot of inflammation, um, particularly in the neurons. So the neurons become very touchy, they fire too easily. And then this can cause things such as tinnitus, chemical sensitivities, migraines. Um, I've already said anxiety again, because these neurons become so fatigued and, and so weak to function, right? So that's why less of a stimulus is needed to make that firing. Um, and we must exercise these neurons to thus re-increase the ability for them to function. Um, again, inflammation, hormone imbalances, poor blood sugar um, are some of the factors that can affect these neurotransmitting neurotransmitters um, function. And so it's important basically to look into all of these underlying causes to address mood symptoms. Um, so, so again, we, we don't want to, um, we don't want these neurons to be too touchy. We need neurons in the right, um, our neurotransmitters be, to be transmitted in the right amount. So not too many and not, not too few. Um, and, and we need the right amount of stimulus for them to fire. So again, this is allowing me to look at all of this, but it's showing you all the underlying causes of some of the mood changes. Okay. That was a lot. Ask me if you have questions on that. 
Um, <laughs> here are some of the neurotransmitters. So we have adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, acetylcholine, glutamate, endorphins. We will go over some of these, not all of them, um, but, but a lot of these we've, we've heard of before. Adrenaline, fight or flight, dopamine, pleasure, um, GABA. This is oftentimes what's, what's um, decreased in anxiety. Serotonin, oftentimes decreased in depression. Um, similar with endorphins. So all of these have a play and we need them all in the right amounts. Okay. Additionally, we need protein to make all neurotransmitters. Um, deficiencies in protein um, and thus neurotransmitters can be caused by a poor diet, poor blood sugar, stress, and some other lifestyle factors. Um, so very important there. We're going to go over all of these now separately, or rather about five of them. Um, so here's serotonin. Okay. When serotonin is impaired, we have a loss of pleasure and interest in hobbies. There can be anger, um, unable to fall asleep and feel like you're getting a restful sleep, oftentimes associated with depression and paranoia. Um, you have a loss of enthusiasm, especially in, in things that you used to find joyful, um, such as food, friendships, um, activities, things like that, also higher susceptibility to pain. So for serotonin, we need iron, copper, magnesium, and B vitamins to make serotonin. Um, we've all heard of tryptophan, right? Which is comes from Turkey. It's one of the, one of the neurotrans, or I'm sorry, um, amino acids that comes from Turkey, uh, which is everyone always says, oh, tryptophan makes you tired. That's why after Thanksgiving, you're sleepy. Um, but reason why I'm bringing that up, tryptophan, again, that um, it's a, an amino acid that comes from protein. Amino acids are the breakdown products of protein. Tryptophan goes to make 5-HTP. 5-HTP is then converted to serotonin. And then serotonin is converted to melatonin, which is why it's difficult sometimes to have um, a restful sleep or unable to fall asleep. Okay, so if we can support... Um, creating serotonin by increasing foods high in tryptophan, that might be helpful. That might not be all that we need though. It might not be a, a matter of low tryptophan. It might be a matter of the conversion of tryptophan into serotonin, some enzyme there that we need to address. However, if we're feeling low in serotonin, it is beneficial to support uh, with dietary sources of tryptophan. So that is mostly meats, um, but beef, chicken, halibut, lamb, liver, um, salmon, scallops, shrimp, snapper, those are all um, high in tryptophan. The more vegetable uh, sources for tryptophan are mushrooms, soybean, spinach, and tofu. So if we can add some of those tryptophan rich foods to help convert into serotonin, uh, that might be helpful to increase that serotonin there. Okay. Again, though, we also need the cofactors, iron, magnesium, copper, and B vitamins to allow that process to move through. So sometimes I find people have some depressive episodes or depressive feelings because they're deficient in B vitamins. So if we can supplement with B vitamins, that way we can allow the body to create that serotonin. Okay. The next one is dopamine. So again, this is a list of the symptoms of impaired dopamine activity. Remember, this is the happy hormone. Um, so when we have low or impaired dopamine, we find it's hard to motivate ourselves to start or finish tasks. Um, we feel worthless, hopeless. Um, there's a very low stress threshold. So we get overwhelmed and aggressive very easily, um, especially under stress feeling like you want to isolate yourself. Um, you're not really concerned for your family or friends, like maybe you used to be, um, and you just have a low overall mood. So there's a lot, um, lot less feelings of desire, joy, and caring for others. It's just a lot of, um, you know, overwhelm, stress, low motivation. Um, the cofactors or, or minerals, vitamins we need to synthesize or create dopamine include copper, 
vitamin C, and again, those B vitamins, okay? Um, oftentimes, as you can see, difficulty starting and finishing tasks, this is associated with ADHD um, and learning disorders. So low dopamine is oftentimes associated with that. Um, however, high dopamine can also be dangerous as it is associated with psychosis, schizophrenia, uh, high libido and hypersocial activity. Um, so, you know, so we want that balance of dopamine. Again, when we have high dopamine, we can go think back on those neurons where um, the neurons might be too close to firing and the synapses are allowing for too much dopamine to be released, right? Um, so again, going back to the neurons and how those messengers and all of that is working. For dietary support for dopamine, we want to increase foods high in phenylalanine. Again, another amino acid. Um, we get that from beef, cheese, eggs, fish, pork, turkey, oats, and sometimes chocolate, which is why we want chocolate to make our ourselves feel happier. I definitely feel that way. I love chocolate <laughs> and it does make me feel happy. Um, so if we can increase some of those more meat products, we can allow for dopamine um, to go down that pathway. Okay. Next we have GABA. I mentioned previously that when we have low GABA, it's oftentimes a cause of anxiety or panic. Um, a lot of my patients come in and say, I don't know why I have anxiety, but I have it all day long every day. I don't know the triggers. I don't know why. I just always feel anxious. Okay, that sounds like GABA, right? Um, also associated with feelings of dread, inner tension, restlessness, um, again, kind of difficult time going, falling asleep or staying asleep because our minds are racing. We wake up with anxiety. Um, can't focus on one thing and, and worry about random things that you never even thought about before. Again, that goes back to anxiety. Um, so we need magnesium, manganese and B6 to allow for amino acids to be converted into GABA. Um, oftentimes we know people take Xanax for anxiety. It works on the GABA pathway and that's why it works for people. Um, GABA deficiency, however, can be brought on by autoimmune disease, gluten intolerance, or a genetic cause. Of course, there's always going to be environmental factors, especially with these neurotransmitters, um, because again, inflammation and, and the, the challenge of detoxing can always be associated. But in particular, um, we have found that autoimmune disease and gluten intolerance can absolutely cause a deficiency in GABA. Now, here's a caveat. So a lot of people want to take GABA, right? I, I see GABA on the shelf at the health food store. I'm gonna buy that and take it. For some it works and for some it doesn't. So why? Let's talk about that. So GABA, um, it's a long word, so that's how you call it, GABA, but um, it's a very large molecule, okay? Super large. And so if it works for you, it means that you have a leaky blood brain barrier. So the blood brain barrier is kind of like the gut barrier, right? Where it's a protective, um, basically barrier for, for toxins to stay out of the brain, right? Larger molecules, toxins, bacteria, we wanna stay out of the brain and only in the bloodstream should they even be there. When we have a leaky blood brain barrier, there is some permeability there. So those things can get through and, and cause further inflammation to the brain. So if GABA is getting through that leaky blood brain barrier and, and supporting a lowered, you know, a less anxiety, better mood, that demonstrates that there is some leakiness because GABA is too big to cross that blood brain barrier if it is not leaky. Okay. Um, so generally GABA is, is a worthless supplement basically generally speaking. So if you've taken GABA and you're like, I don't feel anything, that's actually good because it means that your blood brain barrier is not leaky and GABA is not getting through. Okay. So what we do instead though, is to give precursors to GABA 
um, in particular something like L-theanine, um, that is actually naturally in tea. Uh, that is a precursor to GABA and helps to create GABA, okay? So um, if we have a leaky blood brain barrier, that's a whole other topic in itself um, and something we would need to address, oftentimes correlated with a leaky gut actually. Um, but, um, yeah, that's basically it. I have a whole lot of notes that I already said. So, um, if it promotes a calming effect, then your blood brain barrier is likely leaky. Um, if it doesn't, that's a good thing. Okay. So we need that blood brain barrier. All right. So that's GABA associated with anxiety. All right, acetylcholine. Now, this one is less about moodiness and more so about memory, okay? But it's an important one because it is oftentimes very, um, it's low, especially as we get older, but I do see it, I do see it low um, more so than I would expect. And it is associated with other neurotransmitters being low. So oftentimes we find with depression, there's a, a slower memory or memory lapses that can be coinciding with serotonin and acetylcholine. So sometimes it's not just one, sometimes it's a few different neurotransmitters. So with acetylcholine, um, there's a loss of visual photographic memory, verbal memory, um, memory lapses, diminished comprehension, difficulty calculating uh, numbers, recognizing objects that you would normally know, um, just this overall slower mental capacity. Um, and, and so that is what happens when we have impaired acetylcholine activity. Um, this is the most important neurotransmitter for converting short-term memory into long-term memory. Okay. Um, and this, that conversion happens in the hippocampus in particular. Again, that's inside the brain. Um, when we see acetylcholine imbalances, it also shows oftentimes as an early presentation of Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, so we want to address this soon. Now, um, acetylcholine, we can create acetylcholine by consuming choline. Um, so food sources of choline, most highly rich in um, egg yolk, very high in choline. Also liver and organ meats, not so yummy, but of course they have to be high in acetylcholine. Um, beef, tofu, nuts, and high fat milk fat cream, things like that, uh, very high in acetylcholine. So if you think about it, think of like fat, fat is acetylcholine. Now healthy fat though, not um trans fats or other processed fats, but um, those, those healthier fats are high in choline. If you think about it too, when we think of our brain, um, it uses the most amount of fat, okay? Um, surprisingly, um, if you guys, if any of you guys are college students or even, you know, in career, um, we get really hungry at work, but we've been sitting all day. Why is that? Some, yeah, maybe it's because you're bored um, and you have nothing else to do. But oftentimes it's because when we use our brain, we use so many calories just to think, okay? Um, our brain uses the most amount of calories on a daily basis. And a lot of that is fat. Um, so acetylcholine, good for memory. Um, if it's low, we can, we can see memory lapses, difficulty co with comprehension, things like that. Um, so outside of uh, food sources, there's always ways to supplement as well uh, with choline. All right, we're almost done with, this is the last one we'll go over. So catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, basically I'm gonna lump it in to say adrenaline because that's what we know. So when, it's in, when these are imbalanced, um, you see these symptoms, Catecholamines are responsible for mental alertness, mental speed, focus, concentration, oftentimes also associated with uh, the fight or flight response. That's the sympathetic response of the ner nervous system. So when we don't have enough of those, we find slower. Everything's a little bit slower, 
um, or a lot bit slower. So we have impaired mental performance, slow cognition. And these are oftentimes the people who have a low, excuse me, catecholamines, adrenaline, need coffee or caffeine uh, to function, right? To, to have that brain memory. Um, and so ways to increase catecholamines um, is to consume tyrosine, okay? That's cheese, edamame, eggs, fish, nuts, seaweed, tofu, turkey, and then of course caffeine, but that's not the right way to do it because if caffeine stimulates the adrenals, right? Which create, which is responsible for releasing adrenaline, however, and cortisol or stress hormone. However, caffeine isn't high in tyrosine. We want to support tyrosine again as the precursor um, amino acid to making these, this neuro, these neurotransmitters um, to support uh, mental speed and alertness. Okay, so we also see these low when we have adrenal fatigue. Okay, when our adrenals are constantly stressed out, they can't keep up, we do see a decrease in mental speed, concentration, cognition. Okay, so with the catecholamines, it might be coming from the adrenals or truly from the brain. And that's something that we would investigate and, and, and figure out. Um, we also see fatigue associated with low um, catecholamines or adrenaline. So uh, these are some interesting things here we don't oftentimes talk about in terms of hormones and neurotransmitters. We think of you know, hormones as very separate. However, estrogen, progesterone, um, and even thyroid and testosterone are very, very highly correlated with neurotransmitters. So when we have an imbalance of some of these neurotransmitter um, hormones, they can impact our neurotransmitter or brain activity. Um, so when we're addressing brain health, we must also look into the hormones. Um, so we can um, increase nutritional compounds to boost some of these activities. Um, however, if we have, let's say, insufficient estrogen, um, we're not going to get very far by just implementing dietary strategies. Um, so estrogen impacts serotonin activity. Um, so if, let's say, we have low estrogen, we're not going to have very healthy serotonin. So we can eat all of the tryptophan we want. It might not really help, though, because we have low estrogen. Progesterone impacts GABA activity, mo more so for for women, um, but for both. Estrogen impacts dopamine in women and testosterone impacts dopamine in men. So when we have low of either of these hormones, it's oftentimes also associated with low dopamine. Now that's not to say I have low dopamine, so I definitely, I'm a female, so I definitely have low estrogen. That's not the case. However, it's, it's vital that we have to look into hormones as part of the picture, right? To understand you as an individual and how your, neuro, your neuro, neurotransmitters are being um, impacted, okay? Similarly, estrogen impacts acetylcholine in women and testosterone impacts acetylcholine in men. I think of this again, as we get older, women go into menopause, men naturally are, they create less testosterone, very associated with slower mental capacity and memory. So there's a correlation there with dementia then, right? So um, we have lower of these hormones. So we have lower acetylcholine, thus we have lower uh, memory, okay? So very, very interesting here. Um, and then thyroid hormones impact all neurotransmitters. So again, the thyroid sits right here. Um, I actually have a whole webinar on the thyroid. So if you're interested, definitely go back and listen to that one. Um, it goes into the six different um, presentations of thyroid disorder. Anyway, if we're not creating the correct amount of thyroid, it's gonna impact all of the neurotransmitters. So very important there. If you have hypothyroid, for example, you may also have depression caused by low thyroid. Okay, so hormones, love that. And then we always talk about this, this is repetitive, um, but it must be addressed. 
So the gut and the brain are connected. The brain controls all the movement through the intestines. It helps release digestive enzymes to break down that food. And it also regulates the blood flow that carries nutrients and chemicals to support gut health and repair. So I really like this little picture here because you can see the cycle, right? Um, the brain basically tells the body to do everything. So it's all a part of our nervous system. And then the gut impair feeds back to the brain because it addresses neurotransmitters, mood, behavior, anxiety, stress, all these things, right? Um, so when, again, when we're addressing brain stuff, we have to address the gut and vice versa. Oftentimes when I have people with um, SIBO, for example, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I see a lot of anxiety, depression, and brain fog, almost always. It's rare not to have that symptom. Um, and so it just demonstrates that, that tight correlation there. So we have to look into gut health to see, okay, you know, is it coming from the gut that we don't have enough of these neurotransmitters? Um, that could be do that that could be caused by a lot of things. Um, however, the vagus nerve here is highly um, impacted, or it's a, it's a big impact on the gut and the brain axis. The vagus nerve is the one out of 12 of our cranial nerves that goes all the way from the brain stem all the way down to the gut. Um, so that can be assessed in the office and strengthened in order to improve the gut and the brain function at the same time. Okay. Um, and then we also talk about leaky gut a lot. Um, but when we have leaky gut, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about blood brain barrier, um, those, those toxins, larger proteins, bacteria that we should be eliminating through the stool can get into the bloodstream, get all the way back to the brain. Okay. Um, so interesting there. Um, Again, similarly, I mentioned SIBO, but if we have leaky gut, we oftentimes have that brain fog, anxiety, depression. Um, something I almost always mention as well is that 70% of our serotonin is actually created in the gut. So if we have leaky gut or a poor um, messaging system back up to the brain, we're not going to have uh, very good serotonin levels, right? So we wanna heal that gut to thus heal the brain. Okay, so here are some symptoms of an impaired gut-brain axis. We have some difficulty digesting, constipation or, or irregular bowel movements, gas bloating, frequent um, abdominal pain, discomfort, um, a lot of intolerances to foods, um, poor memory, difficulty learning new things, and difficulty finding the right words. Okay, so that is, um, those are some of the symptoms that we can associate with the gut being involved in this neurotransmitter and brain imbalance. And I, I do see almost, let's say 80% of the people that I see have some sort of impairment in this axis. It's very, very common. Um, again, especially in our toxic world, high, high, high stress, um, medications, you know, are flying around. Those can cause leaky gut and affect this axis. Um, so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of causes, um, and our society environment kind of sets us up for this impairment, unfortunately, but there's a lot we can do about it too. Okay. So some other causes of mood changes outside of, um, you know, just plain neurotransmitters, the gut and hormones. So uh, blood sugar instability, this is a common one. Um, I do have a whole, another whole webinar on blood sugar that I, uh, I talk about a lot actually with patients, um, very, very informational. When we have um, blood sugar instability, more often than not, it's hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. So that feeling of anxiety, shakiness, irritability, um, kind of hangry feeling, lightheaded, faint. Um, you feel like you have to eat every two hours. You know, the, the person that has a granola bar, apple in their purse at all times, that used to be me, totally. I've fixed that, thank goodness. Um, I used to be mean when I'd get hungry because my blood sugar would drop so low. 
Um, so that's moodiness right there, right? Um, and, there, and then it could be the other side too, where uh, it's hyperglycemia and you have too much blood sugar. Um, again, back to the hormone changes, just simply it can happen in anybody, menstruating or menopausal women, andropause, that's our male menopause and thyroid changes um, for all sorts of reasons. Just going back to the importance of needing to address those things as the underlying cause versus just saying, oh, you're depressed. So let's give you, you know, something to boost your serotonin. That might not be it. Okay. Um, situational concerns and changes. So, you know, breaking up with somebody, losing somebody, moving uh, to a new city and home, um, losing a job, all of those can affect our mood. And it might not be, you know, that we need to treat you or fix you. It's just that your body needs to recalibrate and get used to and and adapt to the new things, you know, go through that grief process. There are things that we can support you with to get you through that process, but we really want the body to, to move through those emotions completely. Um, otherwise they can stay in our, in our body and cells and, and cause issues down the line. Um, and then we already know gut imbalances. We already know that. <laughs> so um, it's just not black and white. And I think it's important to know some of these causes so that you can understand, um, you know, try to start to investigate for yourself where it could be that th there's mood changes um, and the cause of them. So again, it's just, it's not here, this works for everybody else. This is going to work for you. Medicine is very, very individualized and it needs to be that way. Otherwise, we're going to be going from this doctor to that doctor to that doctor to that doctor because no one can help us and we feel the same. And we've tried all these things and now there's there's more frustration and anxiety because we don't know because we haven't gotten the answers, right? So just having some of this in your back pocket is going to be helpful for you to start to understand and think outside of the box, like maybe it's not just that. Maybe I need to look into that. Oh yeah, I have been feeling like, you know, my menstruation has been kind of wonky or I've been feeling colder lately and my hair is falling out. Maybe I have a thyroid imbalance that's causing this. So all of those kinds of things um, are important to think about. Okay, so diet for neurotransmitters. Now, we talked about some specific foods um, that are high in specific amino acids to help convert to these neurotransmitters. Overall though, we found a lot of them being protein. I think across the board, it was a lot of protein. Now, that's not to say that if you're vegan, I, I spoke with a vegan individual earlier today and she said, well, um, you know, protein deficiency is very, 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 very rare. So why can't I be vegan? And I said, let's back up, let's back up. Because I think the vegan diet is awesome. It's just really hard for people to sustain. Um, to be vegan, you have to eat a lot of food. It takes a lot of time and effort to prep that food and eat it. And so for a lot of us, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that time, especially at lunch. Um, sometimes even at dinner, we get home late, we're on the go. Uh, you know, we, we just don't have the time to sit there and chew and digest. But if we're going to do a vegan diet, by all means, absolutely. We can get everything we need in a vegan diet. We just have to be smart about it. Again, eating a lot and making sure we're having enough protein. So I'm skipping to protein to say, yes, most it's most bioavailable and easiest to get more protein from meat products, hands down. Now here's the fact of, well, why am I deficient in any of my amino acids? Is it that I'm not eating enough protein? I'm not digesting the protein due to lack of digestive enzymes or a poor gut. Um, because if we have leaky gut, we're not able to properly absorb. So all that protein we're eating is not necessarily converting to amino acids. That's where maybe supplementation comes in or IV therapy, for example, um, but if it's just simply, I'm not eating enough protein, let's increase that protein. Okay. Uh, so making sure we're getting enough quality protein, now quality protein, 
ideally in a perfect, perfect world, we'd have, uh, you know, organic antibiotic, um, hormone free meats. Um, that would be ideal, not available for everyone. And that's totally understandable. So trying to choose the most high quality meat so that you are absorbing and able to break that down without toxifying your body further. Um, branching amino acids, these can be helpful. Um, oftentimes, you know, mostly associated with you know, big bodybuilders, they take amino or branching amino acids after they work out. Um, but they are also found in animal products, nuts and beans. So again, if you're vegan nuts, beans, some of that, those healthy greens also have enough amino acids. We just need to make sure we're able to digest and absorb them and that we're eating enough of them. Um, but the branching amino acids can be helpful. Then healthy fats. So we know that with acetylcholine, we need that fat. Okay, our brain needs fat um, and making sure that they're anti-inflammatory. So a lot of our mood disorders, yes, there's an imbalance in something. However, it's oftentimes also, oftentimes also correlated with high inflammation for many, many reasons. Okay, and we can figure that out on an individual basis, but healthy anti-inflammatory fats are gonna help quell that inflammation so that your brain can do what it needs to do. And those really, you know, quick stimuli, we need a larger stimulus to make that happen, right? To, to make that um, firing happen, right? So that's where healthy fats come in. Um, no processed foods, okay? So I'm talking Oreos, Cheez-Its. Um, I'm trying to think of some other like normal even I'm, I'm going to go out on this limb and even to say Skippy. Okay. Highly processed. I love peanut butter. I love nut butters. Uh, but I'm going to go for the all natural, just peanuts and salt. And sometimes people don't even need the salt. Um, just peanuts and salt. All it needs to be is ground. Okay. We don't need the hydrogenated this and the sugar that, and then this stable. We don't need all that. Okay. So anyway, no processed foods. They're very, very, very inflammatory, very toxic. Um, they oftentimes have, um, added, you know, coloring preservatives, flavorings, all that stuff just causes further inflammation and disrupts the brain chemistry. Okay. Um, there is a high correlation with color additives, in particular red and yellow coloring associated with ADHD, for example. Okay, they're foreign molecules. Our body has to fight them off and it creates mood symptoms. I can go further into that if you guys have questions on that, um, but it, there's a very, very high correlation there. So if we can just get rid of that, it's gonna make our body much happier and it can do its job easier, okay? And then we may consider supplements. Um, this is if, you know, we have an impaired gut, uh, we have very severe mood symptoms. If we're not able to get that much food in um, and of, of the right food. So supplements may be amino acid supplements. They may be um, precursors to these neurotransmitters. They may be the cofactors, like I was mentioning before, the vitamins and the minerals that help these processes go in the body and metabolize to make uh, these neurotransmitters. Um, let's see, anti-inflammatory supplements may be beneficial. And if we do have gut impairment, we can do all this via IV therapy, right? So we have 100% absorption and it bypasses the gut completely. Uh, so that may be a benefit, um, but we will consider supplements on a case by case basis. I'm not going to say, you know, you're low in serotonin, you need these precursors. That might not be the case, right? But we may need to implement if needed. Um, and remember with GABA, we don't want just GABA. We need the precursors to GABA, um, which as I was saying previously, L-theanine um, is one of those. Treatment. Of course, everything I always do is addressing the root cause of imbalance and healing that. Um, that is my main focus in 
in all disease processes or imbalances, I want to find the root cause. Um, we, we do that using symptoms, history, lab work, etc. Then we want to implement dietary changes. Okay, we mentioned most of the dietary changes already. If you have further questions on diet in particular to what you're dealing with, let me know. Absolutely, we can sit down and talk about it. Then we want to address a lifestyle. So this is super important. Sleep cycles, that has to do with serotonin, remember. Uh, exercise, that helps the body detox, right? And it does change the mood because it releases endorphins, right? To help those, um, those happy mood neurotransmitters and feelings of excitement, stress relief. So when we have too much stress, right? Remember those catecholamines can be depleted in high levels of stress. Um, and we oftentimes are unable to relax and calm. And that's where we have, we get imbalances. So if we can optimize your lifestyle, make sure you're falling asleep and staying asleep, getting quality sleep, we're able to move on a daily basis, exercise, that can just be movement, relieving stress, right? So that you can go throughout the day and not be in a constant sympathetic state or fight or flight. Okay, that's gonna allow the body to do what it needs to do because when we are in a constant state of sympathetics or um, fight or flight, other body symptoms shut down, okay? This is things like digesting, sleeping, right? Um, our body doesn't care about digesting if we're on the run. Okay. So if we can relieve that stress calm, we're going to be able to digest the food that we need to make these neurotransmitters, thus fall asleep and stay asleep, feel restful to get through the day, right? It's a whole cycle. Everything's correlated. Um, natural supplementation as needed, like we mentioned, and then in-office tools and treatments. Um, here I have IV nutrient therapy. We offer other tools and treatments. Um, one of those being an autogenic training that is an at-home, um, you know, we, we talk about it in the office, but it's an at-home recording. It's a 16-week training process where you actually retrain your nervous system and your brain to be calm so that you can uh, rest and digest, right? So it brings you out of, of chronic stress and into more relaxation. Um, and it's just retraining your brain to do so. This will allow your body to create those neurotransmitters, uh, use the food that you're eating, um, get that sleep, and we don't have a chronic state of stress. Okay, again, these are all just um, re repetitions, um, but addressing, making sure we're addressing hormones, thyroid, blood sugar, and the gut outside of just the brain. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, when we address these things, we're like, well, how do we know? How do we know what's imbalanced? Well, we take symptoms and then we decide, um, from experience, clinical experience, and just chatting with you as the patient, what is going to be the next best step? You know, I will give recommendations of what testing needs to be done? Is it neurotransmitters? Is it hormones? Is it stool testing? Is it just a questionnaire to fill out, to figure out, hmm, you know, what, what are the mood symptoms? What is, what are the triggers? How can we identify? Um, so we find that out, um, in the visit and then we can test that. And we, we use saliva, blood, stool, and urine based on what we need, not all of them at the same time, um, to do that comprehensive functional testing. Um, and then just to mention here too, with healthy exercise and movement habits, um, exercise is the most profound way to increase neurotransmitters level, neurotransmitter levels. It has been consistently found to be as good, if not better than medication at relieving depression, plus it increases blood flow. So it's tough though, when you're in a depressed state to get the motivation to go out and exercise. Um, so it, it can be a process, a slow, you know, let's start by walking five minutes. Let's start by doing five jumping jacks, right? It's stepwise. But research consistently shows that, um, that we can improve mood just by exercising. Okay, last couple of slides here. So what can you do? 
Um, hopefully that was some good information that you can take and implement starting today, if not tomorrow, to help identify and um, your imbalances and also start to rebalance your neurotransmitters. Um, we want to do that with diet and lifestyle first, right, to support those healthy brain pathways. Sometimes we need support though, and that might be a therapist, a psychiatrist, and it might be an atriotic medical doctor to figure out what those imbalances are. Um, so those are some of the basics. Okay. I've written out some dietary stuff. Um, and then, you know, managing sleep and stress and energy. Oftentimes these mood changes are draining so draining. So how can we improve energy, right? How can we Im implement mindfulness to support a stress relief? Um, so whatever works for you for stress relief. Now I'll give you some ideas of what I give to my patients and what I do for myself. Um, going to the gym is my number one, a walk. Okay. Um, podcasts, music, um, I don't often find that watching television shows or movies are stress relieving at all, but it's a mind numbing thing. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Reading, journaling, huge for my stress relief. Huge, 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 huge. Um, I journal every single night. Oftentimes a prompt that I give to patients is writing down one thing you did really well today and one thing you want to do better tomorrow. This is light. This turned me crazy. Um, so that's an easy prompt. Otherwise, gratitude journaling is also an easy prompt um, just to begin with. But journaling literally helps your body to metabolize your emotions, to process that out so that we're not holding them inside of our body at a cellular level to create disease. So it allows your, your brain to say, okay, I'm connecting, I'm detoxing, I'm getting this out. And that's what journaling does. Um, so other stress relievers, a bath talking to a friend or a parent, um, to your partner, that can be stress relieving. So managing that. Um, additionally, for sleep support, I really like, lately I've been drinking sleepy time tea, um, has just calming herbs in it that helps to promote relaxation. So I've been really loving that. Um, and then just the basics, you know, maintain hydration, again, move, use herbs and nutrients as needed. So it's kind of repetitive there. Again, take home points though, is that you do not need to suffer. You have a lot of options and you have a lot of resources. You just have to tap into them. This is a first step, taking the responsibility and the time to educate yourself on what could be imbalanced. I am thankful for um, you guys joining me, but more so thankful that you have taken the time to do that for yourself. Um, it means a lot to me because I am, as a doctor, I'm really a teacher. I educate and empower you. Um, I give you resources. I give you, you know, clinical information, but I can't do it for you. And so my goal is to educate so that you understand and then can go forward and create those connections and allow you to heal yourself because I don't do the healing. You do. It's all you, which is awesome. And it creates, it, it, um, so we're looking for it encourages you that you are powerful because you are, you have everything that you need already. We just have to make it happen. So with that, I'm here for questions. Um, and then this is just, again, I say this at the end of every webinar, but, um, if this was all you need, you're ready to rock and roll. You have your plan going forward. Perfect happy to be that resource. Um, if you are ready to start treatment, you're like, I need to investigate this thyroid stuff or this hormone or gut stuff because my anxiety is through the roof and you're ready to start. Let, let's get started for sure. Um, and then if you have more questions, we can talk about that too. We can set up a 15 minute discovery call um, and we can chat about the options in particular to what you're dealing with. Um, trying to get away from the sun, you guys, Jeez, Louise. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so we can, we can talk individually um, to see what the next steps are. Again, if you have questions now, I'm here for that. Um, and if you're already an established patient you, and, and this sounds interesting to you, bring it up at our next visit or, or let my admin team know. Um, we can talk about some of this stuff at your next visit. So um, here is my information. I'm going to stick around for a little while for some questions. 
um, because that's my favorite part of these is your engagement so that you feel like you're getting the information you need because this is really your time. Um, so I'm gonna stick around. I love the brain. I love neurotransmitters because it's just not, like I said before, it's not black and white. Um, I, I just appreciate, you know, investigating and looking into everything and figuring, figuring out what is the actual imbalance. Oh my gosh, so annoying. Um, okay, I do have a question here. What types of food can help anxiety? So again, if you go back to the GABA, um, I can go back to that slide. So again, GABA, of course, it's not the only neurotransmitter that's associated with uh, anxiety, but it's a calming neurotransmitter. So GABA, again, is it, it does promote calm. And so foods, I didn't go over foods, huh, did I, with this one? I just talked about the need for magnesium, manganese, and B6. So what I usually like to do for um, anxiety is like I said, L-theanine is, is high, or L-theanine is a precursor to GABA, right? So L-theanine is in herbal teas, naturally. It's just herbally there, available. Um, but I also like um, things that are calming to the system. So. I think of bone broth. Um, I'm actually going to, I'm gonna look some up for you. <laughs> Cause I, you're right, I didn't answer that completely. So, L-theanine. Okay, yes, green tea, herbal teas. Um, Bananas, chicken, potatoes, and brown rice. Um, those are high in um, L-theanine and B6, which are calming, okay? Uh, again, I did mention bone broth that has a lot of collagen. Um, it also has some glycine naturally in it, which is another amino acid that is calming to relieve anxiety. Um, other questions, you guys, hopefully that was helpful. I will say one thing to avoid if you have super high anxiety is too much caffeine. Um, although I said green tea does have L-theanine, just be cautious, especially with coffee, energy drinks, like too many stimulants can really, really cause anxiety. So caution there. Any other questions, you guys? Okay. Well, if you have um, other ones, go ahead and contact our office. Here, I'll go to our contact information. Um, but again, I really hope that was helpful for you to kind of give you some more information on neurotransmitters and what can be affecting your mood. Um, again, it, the information is just absolutely fascinating. Um, I love it. I, I really do. So if you guys need more support, definitely give us a call, give us a shout out. We can jump on the phone. Um, but hopefully you guys have enough information. If you need uh, just reiterations of some of the things on here, um, we can also get that to you because I know my slides didn't have all of the information, otherwise they'd be too busy. So reach out, you guys have a wonderful Thursday and hopefully a beautiful weekend. Clearly it's very sunny here in Santa Barbara. Um, <laughs> so go out and enjoy it, move, exercise, love yourself. 
and we will see you next time. I do have um, a two week doctor guided detox coming up. Uh, we'll be doing it as a group and we'll do check-ins with it. So if that's of interest to you, uh, go ahead and call us and let us know and we'll make sure that um, you're signed up for that. There will also be an associated webinar with that in a couple of weeks. So. Be well, you all, and I will hopefully, if I haven't met you, we'll meet you soon. And if I haven't seen you in a while, come on in and we'll get you taken care of. Okay, 